Um, I am so privileged, guys, to introduce. Um, David expressed a very, very true point of Brad O'Hare. He is the real deal. This guy, I met him only a couple years ago through um, a journey group, and we have some journey brothers in the, in the room. If you've been through the journey, um, it's an amazing self-discipleship piece that um, we just, we love. And I'll tell you, I've grown close to this guy. I'm able to watch him grow in Christ. It's fun to see men be men and women be women, the sisterhood and the brotherhood that we represent so amazing. So without further ado, I'm going to read this because he so eloquently is a wordsmith. And I want to read this to you guys. Um, Brad O'Hara is first and foremost hidden in Christ as a son of the king. Second, he is a husband leading his beautiful bride, Jeanette, into a deeper abiding relationship in Christ. Third, he is a father to three sons, eight, four, and two. He sees them every day as a miraculous part of God's redemption story. Lastly, Brad is a storyteller, and as he is, he is amazing at this incredible calling that he has. He is passionate about asking questions, interrupting facts, and helping people win more customers using the ancient art of storytelling to redeem the modern art of marketing. His story is one of contrast. Light versus dark. There's no gray. Only Brad and only Christ. And one cataclysmic collision between the two. You see, Brad's life is Christ literally started at the wrong end of the gun. Brad's excited, excited and humbled to join us today. So without further ado, if you guys give a warm welcome to Brad O'Hara. It's like a WWF intro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. If I wander away from the podium, forgive me. First, let's pray for Ted and Michael. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this opportunity for us to gather as, as sons of the King. I pray that you will draw us closer to yourself today, not through me, but by yourself. God, I want to lift up Ted and Michael. You're the God of their bodies. You're the God of their minds. You're the God of their spirits. They are your sons. You can do whatever you please with them. We pray that you will heal them and that you will send them back so that they can pour more and more wisdom and more and more life into us. And I ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 <clears throat> well, I, I got to confess, I had a really cool visual thing that I wanted to do and God changed my mind on how I was supposed to speak and, and, and what I'm supposed to do is, is take you on a journey from Eden to Eden. And so I want to start out in Eden, my mother's womb. All I knew was the hands of my father intricately weaving me together the way he wanted me. All I knew was his whisper in my ear before my ears had even formed. <coughs> and slowly over time, the murmurs and muffled sounds of the world outside of that womb came into, came into view. They, they came into to an understandable way to my ears, and I heard a sinful world outside of the perfection I knew. I don't remember that, but I believe it to be true. And we go from Eden to the fall, born into a sinful world, <coughs> to sinful but loving parents, imperfection surrounding every breath I take, even including the first scream to leave my lips. I entered in to a fallen place. Growing up, my mom worked a lot because she loved us. My dad worked a lot because he loved us. My dad also got something that I only knew as MS when I was a little boy. 
And if he wasn't in the hospital, he was away on a business trip. And I resented him for that because I didn't understand it. And my mom working so much, we, we did a lot on our own as kids. Um, and if I only knew the love that they had for me, maybe my life would have gone a different direction at some points. But I rebelled. I resented the loneliness. I turned from a joyful boy into a depressed preteen. And I fell in to the next part of the story, which is the silence of God. And I say that, but I mean this. I believe God was speaking and I was deaf. When I was 14 years old, utterly depressed, eyes wide open in the darkness, I was approached by some people to enter into a lifestyle that would change the trajectory of my life forever. Uh, a lifestyle that I even hid from my parents. And I tried to live in two worlds. I tried to live in the mediocre going to school and, and doing things in a normal world. And I tried to live <coughs> in a world in which I was an enforcer. I grew into an alcoholic. I grew into an ever increasing violent man, young boy, not man. And during this exile, I fell into, and I'm going to speak very plainly. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. I'm, I'm not a beat around the bush kind of guy. I fell into a deep addiction to pornography. My dad bought a compact 386. Computers were just getting popular. We had the dial-up internet. It took you 40 minutes to look at a picture of a naked woman. And I waited every 40 minutes <laughs> to look at them. And I was looking at pornography every day. I was diving into every avenue of darkness I could find because I hated myself. I was lonely, I was depressed, and I was desperate for something. And when I was 15 years old, when I was 15 years old, a friend of mine was shot and killed. And I very quickly found out that he was killed with a bullet that was intended for me. And aside, and aside, that's not something that I have forgiven myself for until this year. But when he died, I spiraled. And I bet if you could talk to my parents, you, you, would, you would hear them say, around 15 he changed. He went from sad and, and trying to figure things out to utter desolation. Even deeper into my addiction to pornography, drinking almost a fifth a day, running towards hell, running towards death. I woke up every morning and tried to decide where can I go today that somebody might kill me because I'm too much of a coward to do it myself. My senior year of high school, I met a girl that God had intended, I think, for a specific purpose. If you, you remember Elijah going up to the mountain every day and praying that God would end the drought. And, and one day Elijah went up and said, coming from the sea, there's a half-handed cloud coming towards me. And he told his helper, he said, go down and tell him, but hurry, because I don't want you to get caught in the storm. And that's what this girl was doing. She was an off-in-the-distance sign that God was coming mm -hmm. and that the rain was coming and that the rain does not fall from heaven without returning and doesn't return to heaven without fulfilling its purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and that girl's family played an amazing part in my life. I'm not married to her. That, that's usually the question I get. So she will I should, no, not, not at all. She didn't even want to date me. Um, she, she shut me down for, for about two years. Um, praise God, because my wife is what he intended. But men, she invited me 
to a youth group. And I walked into a group of people that looked like foreigners, enjoying themselves, nobody paranoid, nobody weirded out, nobody's drunk, nobody's weird. Oh, well, they're weird, but they're not weird on anything. <laughs> uh, and I started attending there every Wednesday night, and I started going to church every Sunday morning. The youth pastor, Mark Davis, and the pastor, Vic Ransom, basically reading my story from the stage, <coughs> reading the desires of my hearts from the stage. And so the exile and the silence of God is coming to a close. I begin to understand what surrender looks like. I begin to understand the truth of a magnificent God redeeming his people. And it was too big for me, guys. When I was 18 years old, about to go to a small college to play football, <clears throat> right after my mother's birthday, the weight of grace broke me. I left home, I went to a friend's house, I got a gun, and I drove to a place my father took me growing up to camp. And the only intention I had that day was to take my life because I didn't think he could use it. I didn't think it was worth anything anymore. It was, it was I was the swine and he was the pearls. And I had a moment that I, I can only describe of, you remember when Jacob was sitting next to the river and Esau was pursuing him and, and Jacob ended up wrestling the angel. I feel the same way because I sat there that night not expecting to wrestle with God. I just wanted to yell at him, say what I wanted to say and get it over with. And I wrestled with him almost all night. And then that moment came where he touched me, ended the dog show, and I broke. And in that breaking, exactly like Jacob, I stopped fighting him and I started holding on for dear life. And I refused to let go until he changed my name. Brad O'Hara had to die that night, whether it was from a gun that I pulled the trigger on or whether it was from him ending me and starting him. It, and, you know, I, I hear all these people say, and I'm adamant against this. I hear all these people say, well, you got to invite Jesus into your heart. you got to accept Jesus. For me, it was a violent collision that I lost. It was submission and surrender and exhaustion Amen. in which I started following Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't a happy-go-lucky moment where I just said, all right, Jesus, come in. It was me begging him to let me in. It was me on my hands and knees screaming and yelling and crying and saying, God, if you can use me, then use me. I'm done. So that's redemption, right? <clears throat> Out of redemption comes what? Sanctification. I think that's the part we don't talk about very much. Sanctification literally means the process of making holy. 1 Peter 1.13, be holy because I am holy. The echoes and the shadows of Brad O'Hara would trail on. They still do. But the glory of God is what lives. And so this process of sanctification, I went into the music ministry. I've been a musician for a long time. I helped lead worship at a couple of churches and then the calling to go down to Williamsburg, Virginia and help plant a church. Was there for five years. Uh, the lead pastor was one of my dearest friends. He, he had fallen into sin and I didn't know about it. And he pushed away from me and, and in a lot of ways wanted to work work things so that I, I would walk away. And he knew my, my stubbornness and my coldness and the amount that I can turn on and off emotions. And so I pushed away from him. And I'm repentant of that because I didn't lean in and call my brother back to Christ. But I walked away. And I walked away angry. And I walked away angry at God for something that men did. I was married at this point to my wife, Jeanette. 
And I'm going to be honest with you guys. I fell back into some of the darkness that God had rescued me from. When I walked away from the ministry and I stopped wanting to hear the voice of God, I started looking at pornography again. And praise God that he has enough mercy that one day I didn't go through my routine of clearing my cash and my wife went on my computer and found it. Because there's nothing that will change you faster than seeing the pain in the eyes of the person you love the most. Discover the darkest thing you've hidden. And it took quite some time for that to heal. And in some ways, I'm sure it's still healing. That's part of my sanctification. That's part of my pruning, my discipline, my, my going on redemption story. But, but what I've felt so strong to talk to you guys about in, in the change is this. Part of my sanctification is to become part of the redemption story. It's not done. It's not just about me. If I am hidden in Christ, then I must be part of his story for other people. I must be part of their knowing of Christ because if Christ is in me and the Spirit fills me and I walk in the Spirit and by the Spirit and through the Spirit, then men who look at me will say, I want what he's got. And it won't be because of Brad. I mean, you heard a little bit of my story. I'm jacked up. If it's on me, people would run from God. But because I'm so, because I'm so unqualified, God shines all the brighter. Um, and, man, time out. I think that's a strong word for you guys. I'm sure there's some men in this room that think they're, they've done what they're supposed to do and now they're just living out. Now they're just living out the rest of life. You are not done. Amen. You are not done. You are still part of his story. You have no right to recline. You have no right to retire from the work of God. You have no right to not be pouring into and discipling <coughs> men like me. Because we are out there, we're in number, and we're desperate to learn from you guys. Because every generation should be all the closer to Christ. Every generation, man. Now we move to my hope. Which brings us back to Eden. Humankind started in a garden. Simple, agrarian, hardworking. God had given tasks for man to do. We started tending his creation and enjoying an intimate relationship with him. Adam walked with God. But get this. We end up in a thriving city. That's the promise. We don't end up back in a lonely garden with just a couple of us and God. We wind up in a thriving city that has no need for a son because God is light. I want to read a couple deals to you. This is Revelation 22 which is the final verse of, of the Bible. Verses one through five talks about the restoration of Eden. And this is a huge part of who I am. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. You get that? There's no seasons. There's no fall and winter. There's just life. 
and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. God will heal Kenya. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. And then the last thing written in, in, in what we read in the Bible. And then this is why I'm so passionate about this. We are warriors for the light. And if you don't look outside, if you don't walk outside every day and look up and say this, shame on you. <clears throat> Change your habits. The end of Revelation 22 says, Amen. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So be it. If that is not our constant, if you're trying to build an empire, you're not probably building his kingdom. If we're just networking to grow our business, shame on us. We're called to a lot more than that. We are called to be citizens of heaven, even here. And you know what that makes us here? Foreigners. It makes us aliens. It should make us unrecognizable to the world. So what's the point? I didn't want to just share my story. That's great. But story should lead to change, right? If you're here, this, if you're, if you're here today <coughs> and you find yourself hidden in Christ, I want you to stand up. called by God, not me, to be part of his redemption story, part of his sanctification story. If you woke up this morning, you're not done. Finish the race. Crawl up to the finish line, full of scars and covered by the blood of the Lamb. I want you to lock arms with each other. <laughs> oh, I guess the news is like, where are you going? <laughs> All right. The hands, arms, hands. Okay. With our shields lock, locked, half covering ourselves and half covering the person next to us. We must step forward six inches at a time into the darkness carrying the light. We are called to be a half-handed cloud to Tulsa, Oklahoma, so that people looking off into the distance will see that the glory of God is coming. God, thank you so much for these people. They're your <coughs> sons and your daughters. Do as you please. But please, God, please. You use 12 men to change an entire area of the world. They're still changing it today. There's way more than 12 guys in this room. Forgive us. Forgive us that younger generations aren't more passionate about you than we are. Forgive us that we're not desperate for you. We have tasted and seen your goodness. 
we have tasted and seen that you are perfect. Your majesty is, is ever enduring and your glory is ever growing day by day. Thank you for the wisdom in this room. I pray that everyone in this room that, that is in a place of wisdom and pouring out will not waste it. I pray that they will even today, before we leave, find a younger man and say, let's grab lunch. We need you, Father. We need you, Spirit. And we need you, Christ. For your glory alone. Amen. 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 Wonderful word. Thank you, Brad. Well, I love you. You remain standing. That's fine. We're, we're almost done. I love to hear people who can articulate well their story. Folks, every one of us has a story. Make sure your story is the one you want it to be, not the one that just happens to be. Amen. Amen. You are free to visit, and we'll see you next Thursday right back here for another great meeting together. Oh,